gang, have you guys ever wondered what does it take to go home and can your own tuna? I have, I've never done it. But, I've been fortunate enough to have a really good fishing buddy of mine, Dave, Dave Theason, get into it. And I made him promise me that next time he cooks up a batch, that he would show me exactly how it's done. And he said, okay. So, we're on our way to go pick up some tuna because Dave just got back from a 16 day trip offshore after the Hurricane Bank, came home with some great tuna. And how was the Hurricane Bank for you guys this year? Uh, it was a challenge this year. And now we're going to his place and go and figure out what it takes to can our own tuna. If that's something that might interest you, hang on. Here we go. All right, gang, so here we are. We're at Dave's house, one of my best all-time fishing buddies' house. And we are here to unravel the mysteries of canning tuna. I've never canned tuna. I've never been involved in the process. I have been enjoying canned tuna from Dave for years. So I'm really, really excited about today's video. And Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going to be happening today. Well, thank you, Yanni. It's really a pretty straightforward process. What we're going to do is we're going to start by cutting up some habaneros uh, and put them into the jars. Then we'll cut up some tuna then put them into the jars. Uh, add a little olive oil and then they go into the canner and we'll can them. It takes about an hour and 40 minutes for the tuna to can. There's a lot of wait time on both look, coming up to temperature and coming down from temperature. But uh, that's basically it. Kind of a three or four step process. Wow. Are we ready for the first step? We are ready. Okay, so I'm going to cut these uh, habaneros into quarters. And I'll put one quarter into each of the jars for, uh, for flavoring. And I'm just going to quarter them. And I'll get the seeds out of there and here's our first quart. Okay, so our next step is we're going to put the habaneros into the jars. Now these are jars I've used before. You can reuse the jars, you can reuse the rings, you cannot reuse the lids. So that's going to go in the trash. So I will take off a few there. Throw those away. And I'm not going to touch the habaneros with my hands because then I'll get all kinds of bad stuff on my hands. So Dave, you said you can't reuse the lids? The lid can only be used one time, so this we're going to throw away. And that's for sanitation reasons? No, because it has a, a rubber seal around here and once it gets used one time, this gets deformed by having been seated here. Uh, and so, uh, since we need to start with a new rubber seal here in order to make sure that the, the jar properly seals. Is it easy to get new lids? Oh yeah, they have them. Uh, Ace Hardware has a real good selection of canning supplies. They have all of these things. Uh, my local Albertson has them as well. So lots of stores carry them, but you can always count on Ace Hardware for having these things. Okay, so it looks like you've got habaneros on the bottom of every jar, or your jars. And so, what's our next step? Uh, our next step is going to be uh, cutting up the tuna and packing in the jars. So awesome. let's do that. Awesome. Okay, so I've cut out a piece here. I'm going to pack it into the jar. Uh, I need to fill the jar up to a little below the rings. So we're supposed to have two centimeters of headspace, and so that'll be uh, a little below the ring. Uh, I have to kind of cut these pieces so they'll fit in there and leave us enough space. Well, you, you jam that stuff in there, don't you? Yeah, we're going to jam it and pack it fairly tight. Um, now that's about right. You can see that it's uh, a little below the rings. And uh, um, after we're done packing the jars, we'll put in the olive oil. Okay, now we're going to add some olive oil. And I'm just going to try and cover the tuna with the olive oil. Do you use a good quality olive oil, Dave? I do extra virgin. You can see that I'm pouring it in here now and it's starting to bubble, which means that there's some air pockets in there and the olive oil settling into the air pockets and, and starting to push the air out of there. Now I'm gonna grab a knife here. Okay, so I'm trying to get the oxygen out of here because the oxygen, any oxygen that's left in here will give it an off flavor. And there'll be a couple more steps along the way where we try and work the oxygen out. 
So I've got the level to go down a little bit because we're getting the oxygen out of there. I'm going to go ahead and top it off. And now I'm going to take a paper towel and wipe the lip because we want to get any tuna that's on there off. Okay, so those four are clean. I've got some brand new lids here that I bought down at Ace Hardware. We'll pop them into the rings. And we're ready to put on the lids. Now you can see I'm not screwing the lids down tight here quite yet. And that's because there is a trick to it. There is a technique. So the lids are supposed to be finger tight. And of course the question is, what is finger tight? And so there's a little technique you can use to do that. Okay, so we're going to make this finger tight. And I'm going to put it up around chest level. And I'm going to use my fingers and my hand to give it a good firm turn, maybe a quarter inch worth of turn. What you don't want to do is get over the top and get your shoulder into it and really reef on that lid. How about that bottom hand? Is your bottom hand twisting as your top hand is twisting? Or is the, top, the bottom hand staying stable? I'm just holding just holding it with my bottom hand. It's the top hand that's providing the twist. Got it. And what's, it, and what's this all about? Why do you have to have a certain amount of pressure on the lid? Uh, the, the pressure is, uh, you need enough so that it will hold the lid in place, so it will seal, but if you really crank on it, what will happen is you'll have it too tight and you run the risk that as it comes up to pressure and it wants to release that pressure, that you've tightened it down too much and the jar will potentially explode in your, in your, in your pressure cooker. Now it doesn't explode with a lot of force in terms of blowing up the pressure cooker or anything like that but it, it will break the jar and maybe break the jar adjacent to it. So we don't want to over tighten it. So now we've got the jars done. Uh, here's our example right here. It's got the habanero in here, the olive oil, the tuna, cranked it down to the right pressure. And we're going to be loading it into our canner right here. Now you may notice that I've got it sitting on a camp stove here. That's because this is an induction range, meaning it works based on magnetism. I have an aluminum canner here. It's not magnetic, so I have to get out the Coleman out of the garage. So that's what we're going to do here is cook it on the Coleman. So we'll grab these guys here and start putting them in. Okay, so we're going to put these in here. And I just kind of, from force of habit, I've got to put them into the same place time after time. Uh, you can see that there's enough room here to double stack them, so we'll do the, the bottom layer first and then we will put on the second layer and double stack them. So, okay, so I've got all the tuna into the canner. It actually turned out I didn't thaw quite enough tuna. I have room for two more jars in here. These two spots are empty, so we'll, we'll can 22 jars this time instead of 24. Now I need to add water because the pressure need, cooker needs to bring the water up to pressure. So I'm gonna add about three or four of these guys. And uh, what I'll do is I'll add enough to bring it up to right about the bottom of these lids here. Of the bottom layer lids? Bottom of the bottom layer lids. So it'll be eh, not quite half full, maybe almost half full. And that's as much water as we'll add. And as we go through the canning process, it will steam and boil off and it will actually lose about an inch in height of water. So, so we'll have plenty of water in there by filling it up to almost half full. We're pouring in what I think will be our last one. We're getting it just about up to the level of the lids. Oh, there it is. And there it is, right up to the level of lids and we're ready to go. Okay, so we've got the jars in the canner. Now I'm gonna grab the lid and put the lid on the canner. And gotta get it lined up there. And we pull it like that. And now we've got a good seal there. It's cold, so now we need to turn on the heat and get it to warming up. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put the flame on high here. So we got our pressure vent right here and our uh, pressure gauge right here. Now, I do not use the pressure gauge uh, for actually determining the, the pressure inside because it's no longer true. Uh, these things stay accurate for a year or two or maybe three, so I don't use it anymore. Instead, I have a weight here, which it's calibrated for 10 pounds. So eventually, pretty soon, I'm going to put this on there, and that will contain the pressure. Uh, and I'll just use this as kind of a just a, a gross indicator. So we're in the venting process, huh, Dave? Yep. Okay. How much longer for this initial stage? Um, we're gonna we're gonna vent for about 10 minutes. You can see here we got a nice spout of steam coming up. <clears throat> that is um, kind of pulling the air, the oxygen, out of our uh, pressure chamber here. We're gonna try and get as much oxygen out of there as we can. 
in order to um, reduce or eliminate any oxidation of our tuna in the jars. And the, the tuna itself in the jars, inside the tuna is starting to boil. And so because we did not over tighten those jars, um, they're loose enough that, that the steam can come out of the, of the jars and exhaust into our pressure chamber here and then it's being uh, pulled out by the steam here that we're venting. We'll vent this for 10 minutes. 10 minutes, wow. Okay, so you can see we've got a lot of steam coming off here. Weight here in my right hand. You can see I've got a glove on so I don't burn my hand. That goes on there. You can see this pops up right away. That means it's starting already, you know, starting to build pressure. This locks the lid so we can't open it by accident. Okay, so it's starting to slowly build pressure. It will take it about 20 minutes to come up to pressure. It needs to get up to 10 PSI above ambient pressure. Then it will um, stay at that pressure for an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, and then it will turn the heat off at that point and wait for the pressure to decrease. It'll take um, a good hour or so for the pressure to come down enough for us, down enough for us to pop the lid off. And Hey Dave, it looks like it's dancing. Yes, our, our uh, regulator valve uh, weight is, uh, is doing what I call toggling. You can see the gauge is about 11 and a half to 12 pounds. Like I said, the gauge is not accurate. Uh, this uh, weight here uh, is regulating the pressure inside the chamber here at about 10 pounds, 10, 10 and a half pounds thereabouts. It has to be an hour and 40 minutes continuous, uninterrupted, at 10 PSI or more. If there's a break in it for some reason, we start the clock again an hour and 40 minutes. Okay, so we've uh, been waiting for an hour and 40 minutes. You can see our, our regulator uh, weight here is still toggling back and forth, which means that it's been doing fine for the last hour and 40 minutes. Um, you probably can't see it, but our gauge reads about 12 here. We know the gauge is not accurate, so we're ignoring it. We're interested in what the regulator weight is doing, still doing good. Now we're just gonna turn it off, and voila, now we wait more. It'll be another hour or so until it cools down to the point where we will uh, take the lid off. So we'll come back to you in an hour or so. And Dave, what if we get impatient and we and we don't wait the full hour? What what can happen? Well, it'll take probably, um, I'm guessing, half hour to 45 minutes for the temperature to go down enough so that the pressure is at, at uh, ambient pressure around here. And so at that point, you can see now this is starting to slow down. In about half hour, 45 minutes, this little button here will drop, meaning that it's, it's cooled off enough to be our current temperature, and our, or at least, our, I'm sorry, our uh, current pressure. So the, that button that you're talking about, that's a mechanical latch mechanism that prevents you from opening up the lid too early? Exactly. It's, oh, it's, wow. It's popped up and now it's got something that's blocking the track, so I can't open it. But when that drops down in about half hour or so, I can theoretically reach up here and, and push those things and pop it open. But the risk I run is that letting all that cold air in there, room temperature air, for something that's very hot right now uh, will get some breakage. So Breakage? What do you mean? The glass will break? Yes. The jars will get two or three or four maybe of the jars breaking on us because they cool down so quickly. So we're going to let it cool off even after this drops. We're gonna let it continue to cool off some more so that we can minimize the breakage. And quite frankly, you know, it's not uncommon to get one or maybe even two breaks. So we'll try and minimize that, hopefully none break, but if we get one or two that break, eh, that happens. Okay, and by the way, this apparatus, can you get this on Amazon? Yeah, um, I don't remember where I got it, but I've, I've definitely seen it on Amazon. I think it runs about 75, 80 bucks. I haven't looked for it for a while, so I don't remember the exact price. But it, it's not terribly expensive. It's under $100, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so we'll come back in an hour or so and pop the lid off and go from there. Awesome. It's been an hour. It's time to take the lid off. Okay. Let's so you can see that our little um, valve here has dropped down, which means that it has reached uh, ambient pressure and it's safe to take the lid off. So we can take off our little weight there and now we're going to pop this open and open it away from us so that any steam comes up will not burn us. Okay, so we're going to turn it away from us as we open it. And you can see that steam is coming off. Oh yeah, wow. And so it's still pretty hot, even though it's been an hour. Did you hear that pop? Uh, yeah, I, I think I did. Okay, the first one just sealed. Oh, are they going to pop individually? Yes. Oh, they each individually pop. 
Yes, what happens is uh, as they cool down, the lid is now currently uh, domed up and it will pop and dome down, which will mean that it did you hear that? Yeah. Another one sealed. Wow. Okay, so we're going to lift these out very carefully. They're still fragile at this point. We're going to pick it up and lift it out carefully and set it on the counter. And we want to disturb these as little as possible because the seal at this point is pretty fragile. So we'll just lift out our, <laughs> we have 22 jars in here. We'll just go ahead and lift them all out and set them on the counter. Okay. Oh, there goes another one. You can see there's little bubbles coming up, so they're still boiling in there. Wow, look Dave, it's still, it, it's still bubbling. Yeah, you can see some, some bubbles of steam coming off here, and it's bubbling up into the head space. Um, and as that steam cools and condenses, it'll pull the lid down and seal the jar. And once the jar is sealed, then you know what? That it can be uh, safely stored? Yes, uh, once it's sealed, it is shelf stable. Uh, typically, you gen gen generally figure about a year of shelf stability, although probably longer than that. But you know, I try and eat them within a year. I store them someplace that's dark because you can see it's a clear jar. So if it's in the light, there's the possibility of photo degradation. So I store them someplace in the cupboard where it's dark, and uh, you know, room temperature is fine. Wow. <clears throat> All right, David, looks like you're done. Well, we're almost done. Uh, unfortunately, there's even a little more waiting. You can see that they're still boiling a little bit. Uh, they're, they're very hot, too hot to handle. And it will take them perhaps a half hour to an hour to cool off and seal. And sometimes they won't even seal for maybe as much as several hours. Um, if you have them here and they haven't sealed after an hour or so, then I put them in the fridge and let them cool off even more. Um, and typically there's maybe one or two that, that don't seal and so those go into the fridge and then I eat those, you know, for a tuna sandwich the next day or whatever. Okay, I'm going to try my hand at making a sandwich. By the way, homemade bread. It's one of the reasons I love Dave so much is he makes homemade bread. Just like me. I love this stuff. What kind, is this whole wheat bread, by the way? It's part whole wheat. It's about uh, one part whole wheat to two parts regular flour. Wow, look at the crumb and moist. Wow. Okay, so I'm gonna make my sandwich. Of course, I, of course, I had to, had to grab one of these habaneros. I just love habaneros. Beyond delicious. Beyond delicious, huh? <laughs> First the mayo. Oh, butterleaf lettuce. Uh huh. Which I'm growing in the garden. I like it. It's good. Yeah. So what have you what have you got in the tuna? Relish. Relish, mayonnaise, and mustard. Oh, mayonnaise and mustard. Wow. Yeah. And then it, it was made with habanero to begin with. It just had just a little spice, just a little warmth from the habanero. And here's the big sandwich. Oh, look at that, look at that, can't wait. So delicious. <laughs> and don't forget sourdough bread. Mmm, and don't forget the sourdough bread. <laughs> it's 5,500 plus a thousand dollar tip, so that's how much it costs. That's how much it costs to go on a 16 day trip? Yeah. Total of about what? About 5,500 for the trip and then a thousand for the tip. Oh my God. And you know, then you got, you know, hooks and line and crap like that. Wow. And of course you live for these trips. Yeah, I, I go on uh, two, two, long, two long range trips a year. I do the 16 day in the spring and the seven, seven day in the fall. And uh, so those are kind of my major fishing excursions. Maybe I'll do a couple of day and a half trips in the summer, but it's kind of the fall and spring trips that are the most fun. Wow, and how was the hurricane bang for you guys this year? Uh, it was a challenge this year. Um, um, turns out we had about uh, seven days of fishing as, as, as things turned out. Um, we were the third boat down there and the challenge of fishing with 
with three boats down there is that the hurricane bank is not that big. So when you're the third boat down, you're kind of picking up the scraps from the other two boats. Uh, so we spent four days as the third boat down there and fishing was very challenging. The boat was catching you know, a few fish per day for that period of time. Uh, then one of the boats left and we got to move into a better spot and then the fishing really picked up for the last three days. Wow, and and what can, are there just tuna down there or do you guys have to find any other types of fish? You know, there's there's wahoo down there, which uh, with the boats down there kind of all the time, at least during this time frame, the wahoo get a lot of pressure and so they get harder to catch when there's a lot of boat pressure in the area. So we caught a few wahoo uh, and for my part when the fishing kind of slowed down, especially during the middle of the day and the tuna aren't biting, I would drop down and you know put on a heavy weight uh, and drop down to the bottom and start fishing for rockfish. So I came back with you know a nice batch of rockfish too. I caught a couple of wahoo. Uh, one I gave to the boat so that we could have a nice wahoo dinner, uh, and one I kept. And then I caught some uh, some rockfish and then the tuna as well. How many tuna did you end up catching? I ended up with 11 tuna. Two of them were cows. Um, I think I had three around 100 pounds and the rest were kind of in the 30 to 50 pound range. So for so for our viewers who don't, who don't know what a cow is, what is a cow? Oh, a cow is a tuna that weighs more than 200 pounds. And that's kind of a, a special thing to catch a cow. Uh, there's also a super cow, which weighs more than 300 pounds. I do not have one of those yet. And then there's been a small handful of tuna that have been caught. Yellowfin tuna caught over 400 pounds, and I've never even seen one of those caught. Uh, so those are very special. And, and all these are yellowfin tuna we're talking about? In terms of tuna, yeah, they're yellowfin tuna. Uh, we're talking about fishing a thousand miles south into Mexican waters on the Hurricane Bank. There are bluefin tuna on the west coast as well, and those are, uh, you know, up closer to American waters, usually uh, within, say, 100 miles of the border or so. And there's some nice bluefin out there uh, that have turned up in the last couple of years. Um, biggest one I've caught is 50 pounds, but they, they've caught uh, a few, uh, a few uh, bluefin in the cow range as well. So there's there's some nice bluefin around too. God, I'm so stoked. I just got back from Dave's. Oh my God. It feels like Christmas. Oh my God. You know what? Besides Dave giving me some more canned tuna, I learned how to can my own tuna. I got confidence today in canning tuna. And, and not only am I going to try canning tuna, but I've got a full vegetable garden back there and I'm going to be canning tomatoes this summer. But anyway, I had a blast. I hope you guys got the confidence to do some canning or maybe learn a few things about canning. And, and thanks for joining me and Dave today. I mean, I had a blast, Dave had a blast, and I hope you guys had a lot of fun too. Thanks for spending time with me. My name is Yanni, this is Fisherman's Belly, and today you and I learned how to can tuna. We'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.